practices in Winston-Salem. This meeting is being recorded. Forsyth County Schools. Super excited to be here with you today. Um, in our district, we serve about 54,000 students, 81 schools, and a very diverse population. Um, when I, it's hard um, being one of the last ones to go um, because everyone chose such amazing women um, from history, but it all always go back to Rosa Parks. And so when I think about the work of SEL, I think about how courageous um, Rosa Parks was to not give up her seat that day, to just say, no, I'm not getting up. And so I think um, in this work, we have to be steadfast and unmovable. And so uh, Rosa Parks comes to mind uh, for me this afternoon. Awesome. I love that. And so happy to have you, uh, Ms. Adams. And so as you can see, we have uh, the, the, the best of the best um, across the country who are leading this work. Um, so I'm excited. So I have lots of questions. I do want to urge people at any point to drop uh, something uh, in the question and answer, uh, as well as if you have questions and I'll, I'll read those off. Um, and we have some, we have, uh, we have um, different people. We have, North, we have uh, Winston-Salem, Forsyth County in the building. Uh, we got Roselle Public Schools uh, in New Jersey here. Um, we have uh, Inglewood, uh, California um, in the building. So um, we have some other Queens, New York is here. Um, we have uh, Wayfinder and some other organizations. Harlem, U U USA is in the building. So uh, we are definitely have people from all over the country tuned in to hear from you. Um, and so with that, I will get into some of the questions. But again, please feel free to drop question and answer um, throughout our conversation this afternoon. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, Dr. Russell and what do you see as the role of social emotional learning in a school district and how do you ensure that it, in fact, it is effectively integrated into the curriculum and culture of a district? Yeah. When I start to think through the role of social emotional learning, you know, it's really about all of the work that um, that we do inside of schools as well as outside of schools. So it's, it's teaching our kiddos, of course, how to regulate um, their emotions, as well as how to interact with others socially. But it's doing that work on a district level, it's doing that work through teachers that are in buildings and through coaches that are also in buildings. So a part of the work that I have the pleasure of doing is making sure that this work is being integrated in schools. And that's equipping our, our district coaches and our leaders to work with our teachers to ensure that this SEL piece is being woven into all of the things that our teachers are doing on a school level. So that means as a part of our academics, as well as anything outside of academics, our non-academics with kids. So again, the integration piece is huge for me. SEL is not just a curriculum or a set along subject. It's woven in or it's a part of everything that we do for kids as a district. Mm, everything that we do for kids as a district. I love that and love to hear how that's happening in uh, Hamilton County Schools. And so I'm, I'm going to come over to Dr. Treadwell. And, and for that same question, um, what do you see as the role of social most learning in a school district? And how do you ensure that is effectively integrated in the curriculum and culture of a district? So um, when I think about this, I can't help but reflect on my role as a principal, right? Like I know I'm the executive director, but I think about um, trying to implement social emotional learning in my school as a school leader. Um, and it started with, right, a curriculum. That was the gateway. That was the entry point, right? Ensuring that every teacher in every classroom had access to a high quality SEL uh, curriculum. But after time, I realized that um, that was not enough for it to really be integrated and ingrained in our school community. And so it wasn't just about the kids, it was really about building the capacity of the adults who were responsible for implementing the curriculum, ensuring that parents were well aware of the responsibility and how SEL would be rolled out from the way we said good morning, the way we introduced ourselves to the way we interacted with our uh, daily stakeholders. And so, um, the curriculum is a, a great easy piece, right? You can find something that's high quality, purchase it, provide professional development. Um, but then it's that ongoing learning that has to take place so that it's infused into the etymology of a school, right? It's infused into the bricks and just how folks engage with students. What I realized is that social emotional learning is a gateway to um, strong relationships. It's a gateway to high quality learning experiences for students because what we're asking them to do as learners 
is to sit and, and collaborate and enjoy uh, learning. But if they don't have the skill, um, we're responsible for teaching them this, those skills. And those are those SEL skills that we're all familiar with. And so um, the way I think about it is it is the plate in which we put all of the other food on. It's what we serve our, our constituents, our students, our families. Um, and as I said, it's not just about what the students are doing. Um, I found the greatest impact when we were able to engage the adults in realizing, oh, wait, I need this skill skill too. Um, and this is what I need to do to really work on that. So that's how I think about that question. I love that. Uh, SCL is the plate uh, by which we we, we serve. And, and, I, and I love the, high, the gateway to high quality learning experiences. Um, I, I love that. And so, but you went into a little bit of like working with the stakeholders um, and all those different individuals. Um, so that brings me to my next question. And I'm going to come over uh, to Ms. Adams. Um, and so here, uh, the question is, what strategies have you found to be most effective in fostering a culture of SEL in schools? And how do you engage teachers, administrators, and other stakeholders in that process? That's such a fabulous question. I love the responses um, from the first question as well that I think absolutely leans into this one. Um, one of the things that our district uh, really focused on um, last year, and so we're a new department, so we're about a year and a half in, um, and one of those things that we focused in on was strengthening adult SEL. And so really, uh, you know, we started, I know everybody always wants to start with the kiddos, but we started with adults. And so we made sure that we provided um, consistently, and we're still doing that, um, providing high quality PD for our professionals, the educators, strengthening the expertise of central office staff and, and making sure that folks really have an understanding of what SEL is and what it's not. Um, and so that was one of those things that we were just like, hey, let's make sure that we start here uh, with and, you know, and integrating it into everything that we do. And so in a district that has so many initiatives, like I'm sure uh, the other people on this call, it was really important for us to make sure that folks could see alignment um, and that we were intentional about them seeing like, okay, SEL is not different than um, the, the code of conduct. Like all of these things work together. SEL is not different than restorative practices. All of these things work together. SEL is not different um, than trauma-informed practices. And so in our district, we've just really uh, made sure that, that, our, that our educators see it um, as closely as possible to one of the, to, to being a united front that all like works and, 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 and leans on the other. And so that's been one of our strategies. Um, we also have um, within our department, we have really been intentional about saying no to silos. And so we've been intentional about partnering um, with other departments within our district. And so we partner with, te partner with teaching and learning. We partner with equity department. We partner um, with personalized learning. Just yesterday, our team was uh, conducting PD with the code of conduct. They conducted PD with beginning teachers. They conducted um, PD with in, uh, in school suspension coordinators. And so we also partner with like communi communications and marketing. And so every, we're constantly thinking about how can we break down those silos? How can we tap into other departments to make sure uh, that we are not, you know, pulling on folks as much to be like, come to my PD, no, come to my PD. And, and people have feeling like there's just so much, um, but really just being in that space where we're collaborating and working together. And so we've been doing that a lot within our department. Um, and as well as just every time there is an opportunity for us to uh, partner with families and, and communities um, and to provide knowledge and engagement around social emotional learning and what we're doing in our district, uh, we've been doing that. And that's been working out really well for us. Mm, I, I love that. I love that bringing together all the, the coherence and that alignment, right? And I, one word that I really love, as you said, is silos, breaking down the silos and how much that we're doing that. And like SEL is even being the catalyst to doing that because before that people were just working in silos, the curriculum instruction didn't talk to student support services and, and student support services didn't talk to athletics, but social emotional learning is, is that glue, that plate um, that we that we were discussing. I'm coming over to Dr. Williams um, and share a little bit here about from East Orange. Um, what strategies have you found to be most effective in fostering a culture of SEL in schools? And how do you engage teachers, administrators and other stakeholders in the process? 
So I think m my sisters in this work, um, Dr. Treadwell and Ms. Adams really said it all. I think that certainly is, you know, it's a loaded question. And I we find comfort in knowing that we all do like the same things, right? We're all you know, partners in this work, no matter where we are located right across the globe. So because the question is so loaded, I do want to sort of break it down into four like gems and nuggets. And so the first thing we do, we did was certainly to assess the SEL, you know, capacity in our district. What do we have that's currently working in our schools? What does it look like on the central office level? What are our students doing, right? Like how are, are our staff members actually taking, you know, assessments on their own SEL to ascertain that, right? We want our adults to be able to impart these skills into students, but we have to make sure our adults are good, are good enough to do that. When I was a school leader back in my other life, you know, I had a teacher come up to me and say, listen, I calculus, that's what I do. That's it. I can't this touchy feely, this relationship stuff, because, you know, I think we've all been educators in this game for a while. We've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, I've been in urban education throughout my career. We've been doing this forever. And so the world, it feels like it's sort of just catching up, especially with the onset of the pandemic. But that we take for granted that adults, right, can just wake up and do this work. But it can be difficult work. And even forming relationships, all of those skills have to even be taught and imparted in our adults. So when Ms. Adams stated that, you know, we really want to take a landscape analysis of what our district is doing, right? What are the strengths and weaknesses and growth areas and gaps? And then we certainly want to build capacity in adults. And we wanted to make this distributive work so it just doesn't rest on the school counselor, the social worker, because you have one and two or, you know, five in a building with 2,000 2, kids, right? And so they're expecting expected to run around like the hair is on fire we know that you know for this to take place effectively and truly be distributed for our students from those that work in the cafeteria to the security guards to the TAs to the principal to the superintendent everyone must be invested um thirdly we wanted to strengthen our student talk we wanted to give our students a chance to be up front outright because we know we want to hear from the mouth of babes right we want to hear how this you know how our work has transformed them so us in partnership with urban assembly we are like a marriage made in heaven we've been working together for the past two years we've had student panels sel showcases our superintendent just recently conducted an SEL in the community series where we feature Jason Wilson, um, who is a renowned author, and he has a film on ESPN3 um, and his work out of Detroit, as well as Brandon Moderate. And this was for the community. And this was to talk about how, you know, our, our males, especially, um, to be able to express emotion and all of those skills, right, that we promote with SEL. Um, but last but not least, um, we wanted to create, we also wanted to, you know, walk the walk. And so we want to show adults, right? Sure, we're training them, professional development, all those things, but we wanted to have 10 success and be able to celebrate with adults. So with the generous uh, donation from Horizon Blue, Blue Cross New Jersey, under the leadership of our board president, Terry Tucker, we were able to secure 21 wellness spaces in all of our schools for adults. These are havens. These are sacred spaces. Um, and so adults see that and they see that our superintendent, he is prioritizing social, emotional uh, wellness and just in general wellness in our district. And I think that really means a lot to be able to provide student voice, adult voice, and to be able to provide, um, you know, safe spaces for everyone. Mm, I love that prioritizing student voice, adult voice, um, amazing work happening in East Orange Public Schools. So thank you, Dr. Williams, and breaking that down because um, it is a heavy question and you gave us those four four nuggets. And so what that's going to bring me to um, is to my next question. I'm going to put it in the in the chat and then and share it. And I actually would like to hear from each of you. You kind of mentioned it, but I would love because I think everybody here wants to learn from you. And so we've talked about a lot of things. So what I'm thinking is that each I would like each one of you to answer this. I'll instruct who in terms of the order will go. So, but just share what is what challenges and so what I, I'm going to amend this just a little bit and share what's one challenge uh, that you have faced in implementing SEL initiatives in your district and how have you addressed these challenges so we could just do one so you have to say multiple ones so that way we're going to get four different challenges um, that people have faced um, and so we'll start with Dr. Russell um, and if you can share one um, challenge that you have faced and how you addressed it um, and I think that would be a really great takeaway for people because um, they're probably facing some of the same challenges. 
And I, I, I heard this challenge in my, my uh, remarks. So one of the largest challenges that we face with the implementation of SEL or SEED here was adult understanding. So as we started to roll out uh, the initiative of uh, social emotional learning, social emotional and academic development, we had to make sure that we educated individuals around what that means and you know what it means for kids as well as what it means for adults. And you know, if I'm I'm very honest, I I think a lot of our adults um, struggle with uh, what that looked like in regards to their content. So if you can remember, Brandon, you were a part of our initial work and you had an opportunity to come to Hamilton County and help us train a group of adults, we started to think through what are some structures that we currently have that align with social emotional learning. So when our adults started to realize, here are some things that we're currently doing um, that's helping students with their um, you know, self-awareness and with their social awareness, with things of that nature, they started to understand how they could implement this. So again, I go back to the lack of understanding for adults was a challenge for us, um, not just uh, within our schools, but also within our community. We had to do some teaching around what SEL is and how it's beneficial for our kiddos. But with that consistent communication, we've gotten better each year. We've gotten better and we have our teachers as well as our district leaders and our community leaders community uh, partners that are able to communicate around what social emotional learning is for our kids and how it's helping our kids. Mm, I, I love that. Thank you for sharing how you've uh, conquered that challenge in your district. And, and I love that you're, we keep building upon it um, each year. And, and I, I remember, so interesting uh, what uh, Dr. Russell uh, mentioned, that was like two weeks before the world shut down, literally, like literally two weeks before the world shut down in 2020. So it's really great to hear um, all the amazing work uh, that is taking place and that you're leading. Um, I'm going to come over to Ms. Adams to share, uh, you know, what is one challenge that you have incurred uh, and how you've addressed it? So Dr. Russell, that that is the bit that is probably the biggest one. You said all of those things that I would say um, as it relates to just, you know, understanding what SEL is and what it is not. Um, if I had to just add to that and, and pick another challenge in our district, this year our superintendent uh, said to me that she wanted uh, SEL curriculums across our entire district. And so that was amazing. I was excited. Um, but implementing SEL curriculums across the district uh, is a challenge in and, in and of itself because of people not having understanding, people not having, um, you know, may not necessarily, or maybe they haven't been communicated the why as it relates to why this important, it is important for students to have the opportunity to cultivate and practice those SEL skills, right? Um, and so some of the things that um, we've been able to do in our district to overcome that is really like, so our district is, uh, like I said, told, uh, shared with you all before, it's 81 um, schools. And so across that, we have five areas and we have five SEL coaches. And so our SEL coaches, some of them who are present um, on this call today, they really uh, have their set of schools that they're working with and, and really working with their schools to, you know, eat that elephant one bite at a time and understanding that, hey, like we really, what we're after here is uh, what our friends at Castle would call systemic SEL. We don't want just the, the you know, the frills and, and the, um, those things that are, are you know, kind of surface, but we want to really make sure that we're getting to systemic SEL. And so um, some of those things, some of the ways that we've addressed that is through having the support of our SEL coaches being on the ground, working directly with schools, um, helping support their challenges. One of those things um, that I do uh, within my role is I present um, almost by uh, bi-monthly to principals in our district so that they have an understanding um, um, and can really support the implementation of rolling out um, this curriculum with fidelity. And so in our district, we utilize two SEL curriculums, um, Project Wayfinder and Second Step. And so really constantly 
pouring out resources and supports and, um, and trainings and, um, and just making sure that schools have everything that they need um, to be able to implement those things with fidelity. And so those are some of the things that we're doing and I would say is, is definitely an ongoing challenge when starting something new. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you so much for, for highlighting that and, and just sharing again, we're just hearing living from the field, like how people are addressing challenges and we really appreciate that. And so I'm going to come over to Dr. Treadwell uh, to share a little bit of, you know, the third largest school district in the country. Um, you know, what are some, what is one challenge that you're facing and, and how you've addressed that? Sure. Um, and I think we're shrinking. I think we're going to number four. I don't know. <laughs> so we'll see what happens as our numbers continue to change. Um, but one major challenge is actually on the along the same lines as my um, previous speaker spoke about around curriculum. But it's more so in the high school lane, right? What we know is that SEL has been this thing that has been elementary specific or elementary focused. And so a couple of years ago, um, I wasn't in the role just yet, but the department um, had the insight to begin to think about how can we support our high school um, teachers and educators with supporting students with their social emotional learning skills, right? Um, there's so much that goes on in that space. And most of those teachers are content specific. I teach science and that's it. And so one of the ways that we try to tackle this is by um, partnering with our teaching and learning department to do some work with uh, SEL integration, right? And so taking on some of those content areas, those major content areas that are taught in high school and embedding within that curriculum. So CPS a couple of years ago um, created their own curriculum, right? So that teachers can have access to universal curriculum. So in partnering with these departments, we began to tackle science, social studies, world language. And this year we're digging into uh, math and ELA to begin to to um, integrate SEL skills within that curriculum. And we're talking about how to provide professional development to those teachers so that it's not just, oh, this is that SEL skill, but really how to do what some of those other more robust curriculums do breaking down those skills and providing the resources. Um, but that's one of the ways that we're really addressing that challenge is integrating it within the curriculum. Um, and then even this year, we're thinking about going a step further with that process is because the, the integration is great, but we also know that you need the opportunity to have that explicit skill, right? And so we're thinking about how can we begin to provide curriculum for uh, our nine to 12 students and populations there. Um, and so that's how we're attacking that. It is a heavy lift because again, High school teachers are very content specific and there's so many nuances that happen in that space from time and structure and department chairs and, you know, bell schedules and all of those things. But what we realize is that those students more than anyone, I think, really need that explicit skill instruction along with the integration um, because they see so many social challenges. And this is just one of the ways that we're really trying to tackle that. Mm, high, high school SEM limitation. Man, listen, I think that, that's a whole nother webinar, right? Um, but I think you are right. That is definitely a, a big area of concern. And thank you for sharing um, some of the approaches that you're taking to um, address the challenge. And we'll cover Dr. Williams um, and hear a little bit, uh, what's one challenge and how you've addressed it um, in East Orange? So I, I, I agree with everyone before me. I think the high school piece, it is huge. And it is certainly one of our challenges. I'll just add um, really the question trying to determine um, how much intentional standalone SEL time is required, right? Versus how much can be conducted in the classroom to be truly impactful from st for students. The time factor really is an issue, right? Like how much balance and how much time, especially on that high school level, right, is realistic and what is needed to be truly impactful. And one of the ways in which, again, we make this a more distributive approach and that everyone has a hands on it, you know, is we this year we applied, you know, we wanted to introduce the DESA. So certainly that is an SEL assessment. And so we partner with Urban Assembly for DESA implementation. And that is a tool in which, again, so not just your school counseling, your social worker, administer it for students. And on the elementary level, adults take the assessment on behalf of students. High school students, they take their own. And so we recognize that this has been a problem and so we wanted to, again, utilize DESA. And so everyone is responsible for these shared metrics. 
right? Everyone is responsible for implementing, um, you know, the, the plan to move students from needs improvement to an area where th there's growth. And so that really been instrumental in us trying to break down those barriers and mm -hmm. adding this uh, piece to me that is sort of next level to this work. I, I love that. I love uh, universal social emotional learning, making sure that it happens across the board, that teachers are involved in this process, right? We earlier, someone mentioned, right, you have a school with three social workers, two school counselors, 2,000 kids. It cannot be responsible for five people to teach 2,000 kids skills. Um, and so I really appreciate you highlighting the approaches that are taking in East Orange. Um, and so this is, I'm going to come to my, my next question over here. And I'm going to start with Dr. Russell, because we talked a little bit about what goes on in schools. Um, and working with stakeholders in schools. Uh, but my next question is, how do you involve parents and families in the district's SEL efforts? And what steps do you take to ensure they are engaged and supportive? Yeah, that's a really good question. That could probably be linked in with sometimes some of our challenges uh, because it goes back to making sure that our parents have a have an understanding of the SEL work that we're doing here in the district. So when I really start to think about our family work, uh, a huge piece of that is gonna start with communications. As you all recall, I mentioned making sure that our parents are aware of the SEL supports that are in buildings. It could be school counseling. It could be the curriculum that we're implementing. Um, it's the uh, integrating this work is making sure that our parents have a clear understanding and educating them but then another way that we engage parents is by allowing parents to share their thoughts and their feedback. So we send out a pulse check, which is a little short survey that we provide for parents uh, each quarter, and we get their feedback around work that we're doing uh, with SEL. We also have something that's called student success planning, where we create individualized plans for our kids, and SEL is a huge component of that. So when our parents visit schools, they have, an, they have the ability to look at their student's profile or their student success plan. And then they'll have an understanding of what strategies and skills are being taught to their kids uh, regarding SEL. So again, it's building that awareness and, and understanding of what SEL is, and then making sure that we're communicating to them constantly, and then giving them that opportunity to communicate back to us through our pulse checks. So those are those are ways that we're we're working really hard to engage families. Uh, but I'm open to other ideas because I know this is a you know this is an area that that we really need to work on a little bit more. Uh, definitely. Well, I think highlighting just that, just that communi constant communication and sharing some of the ways that you're ensuring that parents are just aware, right? Same thing, kind of demystifying that, because I know people, when they're bringing in assessment or curriculum, people are like, what is this SEL? And, you know, um, diff different parts of the country see it differently, right? So I'm um, engaging in parents. So I really appreciate you um, highlighting what's happening in Hamilton County. I'm going to Dr. Williams to share a little bit about um, involving parents and families in the district's SEL efforts um, in East Orange. So thank you. So we we do a lot of the same similar um you know efforts and events. We you know we we just want to meet parents where they are. We know that COVID certainly has changed education and life as we know it. Parents immediately, you know, converted living rooms and bedrooms into classrooms. And so folks are still recovering from that, right? And so, you know, we try to really broaden our communication to parents. So we're still on Zoom, right? We're, we have a number of school portals that communicate to parents. We still do in-person events. Um, my department um, actually houses the parent uh, and community specialists here in the district. And so even last night, we had a workshop where we brought someone from the New Jersey Bars Association attorney to discuss, you know, how to set up trust for your students how to create um, plans for your special, ne special needs, SEL and plans outside of post-secondary life, right, for our special needs students. So we want to be able to address all aspects because we know we are, even though, you know, we are the community district, we are the community school. And so parents look to us for a lot of resources um, and answers. And so lastly, I do want to point out, I just mentioned DESA, our SEL assessment. We encourage schools to send DESA results home. Okay. So, you know, monthly parents can have a printout of how their child, same as if it were standards for ELA and reading and state and common core standards, parents are also getting the results of, you know, their DESA students, right? Like DESA results for their 
kids because it's important to understand, you know, we meet with them about SEL. What is it? You know, what are the, the power five, right? The castle standards. But we also want parents to see tangible results and we want them to chime in on their child's progress. So we of, we often hold sessions where we empower parents to continue the work from school and bring it at home as well. So. Mm, sessions empowering and introducing SEL as soon as to the parents and they're bringing that information home. They can continue what's happening in the school. I mean, woo, that's a, that's really powerful work, uh, Dr. Williams. So I really appreciate you uh, sharing that. And again, I just know people are like, watching and just taking lots of notes like look all these just gems just gem after gem after gem um so so that's great and so we'll go to my next question i'm coming over to dr treadwell um drop the question into the chat and then ask it um but we 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 have across the country where the united states of america is a melting pot right there are so many different cultures so many different ethnicities heritage uh that makes us who we are makes our communities what they are how do we address uh potential cultural biases in our sel instruction and assessment practices? I mean, this is a heavy question. Um, and I think it's one of those things that's evolving um, over time, real time, right? Um, I don't have a, a, a complete answer. But when I think about this, I think about how we engage in our equity work, right? How we engage in conversations around equity. Um, and thinking about SEL as uh, an issue of equity, right? And so um, when I center it in the lane of this is something that kids need or adults need in order to engage in life, not just about a curriculum, like SEL has gotten this bad rap of being a bunch of things that it's not, right? Um, but really centering it on, don't you want your child or your children to be able to communicate effectively? right? And most parents will say yes, right? Um, or don't you want your child to be even engaged in a sports um, activity effectively? These are SEL skills, right? These are things that you need in order to engage just in life with people. And so that's why I start with it to address it is just from an equity standpoint, how do we begin to say, um, this is something for everybody, no matter your economic status, your school status, your race, your creed, everyone deserves an opportunity to learn how to navigate life and deal with their emotional self. Because what is true um, to education in any entity is that you bring your entire self to wherever you are. You don't turn off parts of yourself. We try to, but the truth of the matter is wherever you are, your human self comes to an environment. And when it's not regulated or it doesn't have the skills to be able to engage appropriately, you have to kind of pause and say, well, what is needed there, right? And so um, in instruction, if I think, if I go back to the, the, the questions, the cultural biases, what happens is, is again, teachers or adults or parents or community folks think, well, we don't have time for that. But if we're thinking about educating the whole child, right, then my bias begins to get, um, it, it, it goes into a barrier space because what I understand is that in order to ensure that I'm teaching to the whole child, I have to deal with the social aspect, the emotional aspect, as well as the academic parts of them, right? But I can't reach the heart or the, the mind without reaching the heart, right? And those are the gateways and to, you know, to begin to dispel some of those biases that come up with folks, right? We're all human beings. That is our equalizer when I think about this, right? And so starting those conversations just from the point of equity gives you a foot in the door to begin to say, let's think about this a little bit differently. And then even in, um, and I don't want to take up all the time because time is just ticking away, but that's how I think about it from that SEL, just that instruction space, right? When I think about my value and my time in a classroom or my value and time in a school setting, I get more time to teach those high quality instructional um, lessons when I've taken time to take care of the needs of the children, right? Um, and then the, the true is the opposite. When I don't take time for that, kids tap out and then I'm missing an opportunity to really, again, engage in teaching the whole child. And so um, that's just one of the ways that I think about it. It's an equitable issue, right? Cultural biases, yes, but it's really an equity issue when I think about that. Mm, it's an equity issue. Teaching, 
explicit social emotional learning gets us to equity. Oh, that's right there. You know, listen, I mean, all of you, I, I mean, I'm gonna have to like drop the cash app because we take up offering because we are having church today um, in terms of everything that is being shared. Um, uh, but I really love that response. Um, and so I'm going to just stay in that area just a little bit. Um, and I'm going to come over to Miss uh, Miss Adams um, and share my next question which is how does SEL instruction contribute to the broader goal of creating a socially unjust and equitable learning environments? And so you can build on that and stay in this, this, this area for a little bit before I switch back to another, our area of implementation of SEL. Yeah, so I think someone said it earlier and this is something that I say all the time is that you know SEL is the plate, right? And so everybody likes to think that their work is the plate, um, but you know, as, as many of these um, amazing women have said here today, is that space of you, your SEL skills and and the you know making sure that we're self aware, uh, that we are managing appropriately, that we're socially aware, relationship skills, responsible decision making, all of that allows for us to lean in and have those hard conversations and address uh, the inequities in, that are within our system, right? And so we want to make sure that with um, one of the things that we're constantly doing and evolving in and, and learning and leaning into is how can we elevate youth voice in our district? How can we give students more agency? How can we make sure that our uh, classrooms are uh, supportive for all and not just for some? How are we making sure that we are not utilizing SEL for those kids, but we're making sure that SEL is available um, to support all kids and all young people, regardless of where they are, how they identify? Um, and so those are some of the things that you know, I feel in, in our department is really one to lean into and help people and help support our schools with making sure that it's a space for um, where we are thinking about how do I how do I increase the sense of belonging? How do we make uh, school a more joyful place uh, for all those who are in? Because we know that like if I'm coming to work every day and I'm not feeling it and I don't feel a sense of belonging, then I'm not gonna be happy. I'm not gonna wanna lean into that. I'm not gonna wanna contribute to the vision. And so making sure that our students see themselves as a part, they see themselves as partners, um, you know, and our most important stakeholder is, is so critical. And so I think helping them, um, you know, continuing to develop their identities, being able to speak out against um, injustices when they see those, uh, see those in their classroom and in their spaces and, and being able to have those amazing conversations of, of opportunity um, for them to talk about um, you know, their culture and, and who they are and their lived experiences and me understanding that maybe just because I look like you, our experiences can be completely different. And so we want to make sure um, that as a district that we're leaning into that and we're providing students opportunities to learn about themselves, but learn about each other as well. And so I think that, that, um, that that's critical uh, to the work um, of SEL and making sure that we are being, um, that we're keeping equity in mind, that we're keeping um, uh, just all of relationships and this important work at the forefront. Hmm. I really, I love that you highlighted so much and just thinking about all kids and even thinking about like, yeah, just because we also may look like each other, our experiences are different, right? And and how we can't allow those biases to, to play a role in how we help students develop social emotional learning uh, skills. Uh, we're, we're, we're just on a roll, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just keep going. Um, and so uh, we talked a little bit about inside the school. We've also talked about families. And so actually what I would like to get into um, is that with our school districts, we have lots of community partners, right? And like the school district is this like central hub uh, for so much. And so uh, I want to come over to um, Dr. Russell um, and hear a little bit around in Hamilton County. Um, how do you work with community organizations and other partners to support SEL initiatives in the district? And what role do these partnerships play in the district's overall strategy? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, you all heard me talk a little bit earlier about our student success planning work, and that's really a system that uh, that is really leading out of our equitable work um, in Hamilton County Schools. So when we think about student success planning, uh, there are multiple components, but a huge component to that is uh, family and health. So we have SEL, we have family and health, we have future ready, which kind of leans into that college and career space. 
Um, and then we also have, uh, you know, our academics is there. So when we start to think about our, our family and health and community partners, we think about this work as not just schoolwork. So I know the conversation that we've been having today is about all the things that we've done um, as a district. Each one of us has been talking about the work of teachers and district leaders and all of our school supports. But we have to realize that only about 20% of our students' time is spent at school. And they spend roughly about 80% of their time outside of school. So we can't do this work alone. So here in Hamilton County, we really have educated our community partners, such as some of our larger organizations. And we're telling them, if you're really wanting to help our schools, then let's consider, let's look at our data and consider how we need help. So if, is it help in SEL? Do we need more mentors in schools? Is it help around homelessness? Uh, we have a lot of our kiddos that are without homes. We have a lot of our kiddos without food. So we're really trying to align our supports with our community partners by educating them on our real needs and then making sure they understand that we can't do this alone. So again, with student success planning, we have a really clear drawn out um, plan around what our kids' strengths are and what their needs are. And then we communicate that to our partners that are willing to help. And we say, hey, this is how you can help. Um, again, if it's mentors or things of that nature, this is how you can help. And then making sure that they know we can't do this work alone because most of our kids' time is spent outside of school. And then as our community partners are working with our kids, we align our work. So we talk about the curriculum that we're using, SEL curriculum and strategies. We've had a lot of our SEL coaches that have gone to like our rec centers and that have worked with our organizations like Girls Inc. to teach them some of the strategies that we're using using schools so they could also be used outside of schools um, in our out of school time space. So that's work that we're doing with our partners. We're really elevating them and helping them to understand that schools can't do this work alone and we need them. And then we're talking to them about how we can utilize them. So we're making sure that they're providing um, the most needed support to our kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's just outstanding. I, I love the, the entire response and thinking about naming different organizations that are really large ones. And I think about in almost any community, there's, there's, there's a Girls Inc., there's an Urban League, there's the Boys and Girls Club, and like partnering with them is, is essential uh, to create an a, a ecosystem of, of social emotional learning. So I want to come over to Dr. Williams and uh, share a little bit about what that looks like in East Orange. So I always say, like, if it takes a village was a district, it would be us <laughs> because we understand that certainly the importance of that work. When I arrived here about a little over two years ago, um, we really wanted to look at what was there in place and to be able to make sure we sustain those partnerships as well as look at the gaps and figure out what we don't have, even looking at a, you know, a tiered system of support, what were we missing in tier two, right? We found sometimes schools reporting, they only have like three tier two interventions, two tier three interventions. And so I'm like, you know, we're like, we need the community to rally around us and begin to build, right? Like this, this menu of options so that we can, you know, certainly service the children holistically, right? And so, um, you know, we work very closely. We're very blessed to be able to work very closely with our city, the city of East Orange. These are the same students. Again, they come to the summer for programmings and jobs, and it really started there. Um, we were able to take our students, I'll just give you some examples of partnerships that we've created and sort of maintained. We were able to take, you know, our girls to Yale University for a visit last summer. We did that through the city of East Orange. We worked with, um, you know, a lot of organizations to be able to provide opportunities, um, even Urban Assembly, right, uh, VIP Academy. Um, we were actually honored by the city and a few other places, but I'll, I'll speak specifically about this. Um, you know, we would not have been able to provide our schools even with wellness lounges without this general and, general and sizable um, donation. And so it's important for, I say all that to say, to make a long story even longer, um, I think just realizing what you have and what you need as a district, right? If you need more, we have counseling services here available to every single student during school hours, no charge to any single family, right? No insurance cover, any of that. And we were just able to foster 
partnerships and grants, we look through grants, see what we can apply for, um, because it's it's important. It matters, and it really does take a village. And I've also learned uh, one more thing. It's also is equally important to document what you're doing because I was guilty of that my first year. I'm like, wait, we have that, so now we 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 document. We put it on film, we brand it on social media, and it's you know certainly not false advertisement. That's what we do. And so when you do that, places will seek you out. Hey, we have money. This is a corporation. I see you're doing this. I see this is your initiative. And so we really take pride in that. Hmm. I love that 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 documentation and that, and and that documentation leads to sustainability, right? Um, and making sure that we we do that. So I thank you for highlighting that and, make, and making that known. Like I got a document. I, everybody just make sure you're documenting what you do, um, so that it open it just opens up so so many doors uh, when you tell the story. Um, and so we have uh, ten minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna um, ask questions. I have some more questions, but I'm probably gonna ask one person and then move on to. Um, another one. So what we'll do is we'll start this one and we'll come to Miss Adams. Um, and this one is, even though everybody said they could answer this one, like I said, we want to move through the last 10 minutes and get through some more questions. Um, how do you support, uh, we've talked a lot a bit about it, but maybe give a little bit more in-depth response for this one is, how do you support the professional development of teachers and staff in SEL and, and what resources do you make available to them? Yeah, thank you. So um, in our district, uh, we offer like um, ongoing and ongoing professional learning um, regarding SEL um, through our Canvas platform. Um, we offer monthly uh, two-day trainings on restorative practices. Uh, we do a, a quite an in-depth uh, newsletter uh, that's filled and linked with the resources. Our team is always available um, to go out and partner with schools and they offer and, and do uh, professional learning at the school level. So one of my SEL coaches right now, she's training um, a middle school staff on restorative practices through uh, PLCs. And so she's doing that all day. Um, we also like, you know, work to make sure that we are uh, anytime the, the district puts out any type of communication, like we have a monthly or a weekly, excuse me, keeping you informed. So every single time we're like dropping little nuggets about self-awareness or self-management, even into those small little bite-sized pieces uh, within, um, within our district. And so those are a few of the ways uh, that we are engaging our folks uh, with professional learning. Again, um, I shared this a little bit earlier in, in regards to offering uh, professional learning. We know that principal buy-in and principal leadership um, and understanding uh, SEL and all that it is, is is critical. And so every month, um, or I'm sorry, bi-monthly, uh, I'm a part of those meetings and, and, and we're, I'm working with our equity, our chief equity officer to provide trainings and support uh, to our principals and assistant principals um, in the area of SEL. Mm -hmm. I love that. And thank you for, for highlighting that. We got eight minutes left. So I'm going to drop this last question and we're going to have everyone answer it. And that's going to actually bring us, to, that should bring us to a close. We keep the answers about one minute, one minute, 15 seconds, and we should be right at about 158 uh, so that we can um, end on time and respect everyone's time. Um, so um, just think about everybody that's here and the fact that this is recorded and the world will see it. Um, we'll, we'll use it in trainings and stuff like that in terms of just the conversation because so many gems were dropped. Um, what advice do you have for other districts looking to implement or improve their SEL programs based on your experience um, and success? Um, so if anybody, everybody wants to share one nugget um, that they would love to share in terms of this question, um, and we'll start with Dr. Treadwell. Um, so I have a saying that I, I love to use, especially when you're implementing new curriculum or programming, it's go slow to go fast. So building a very strong foundation, evaluating what's working, what's not working, but go slow so that eventually it'll take full steam um, and you'll be able to move at a much rapid pace, a much more rapid pace. Um, but start off slow, build the capacity of folks, and then you'll 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 start soaring. So I love that. Build that capacity. Start slow. Build the capacity. All right. We got we got our that's boom. We got that. I love that. We're going to come over to uh, Dr. Russell. Yeah, 
I love that. Uh, so in addition to uh, going slow to go fast, you know, I, I would say don't become weary in well doing. So, you know, anytime you're implementing anything new, uh, there's going to be pushback because people are trying to understand. Um, but keep with the good work. This is great work for kids. And actually, it's just great work for the community. So I would just say stay committed to the work and just don't become weary. Just stick with it and be courageous. Don't become weary, stay courageous. Absolutely, because it is challenging, um, right? And we, everybody here is large school districts. You got thousands of people, right? Um, and I think about the fusion of innovation work, and like you got, you got your, you got your early adopters, you got your influence. Like I'm on this. Is everybody after that bell curve and everything after is a is a challenge? Um, but um, yes, stay courageous. Um, I, I love that. We're going to uh, Dr. Williams. All right. So I would just say focus on the core four, even in its infancy stages. So you have, you know, what story does the data tell you? So data, leverage partners, think about your adults and your students. So if you put a post-it somewhere, you got the core four. And then just like, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues in this work, start slow, four. No, right. The core four. Uh, I love that. Put that on a post-it note. Keep that nice, near and dear to your heart. And uh, Miss Adams. Yes, yeah, so I'm always reminded um, of a quote from a Shiro in this work um, for me, and that's Dina Simmons. And, um, and so she says that good intentions don't equal good outcomes, right? And so I think that as we are in this work that yes, we have to be intentional, but we also need to make sure that we're steadfast and focused on the outcomes for our students and the well-being of, of them and their future and, and making sure that we are doing all that we can um, to provide the action steps of what this looks like. What does, you know, implementing high quality SEL in your school, what are the action steps? What does it look like? And so um, I'm always just reminded about good intentions don't equal good outcomes. And so wanting to make sure that people have intentionality, but they also have those action steps. Mm, intentionality with the action steps equals high quality across social emotional learning, but high quality outcomes, period, which is what we, which is what our districts want, but that's what our kids deserve. Right. Um, and, and how we we build that. So um, one, I want to thank you all, uh, Dr. Russell, Ms. Adams, Dr. Treadwell, Dr. Williams. I appreciate you for responding to the call to be a part of this webinar um, to talk about how you all are implementing social emotional learning across a district. Um, it's just, I mean, it, this was, it was just so powerful. Um, and I know there was so many gems dropped, lots of people taking notes. Um, so I really appreciate and thank you for that. Um, and thank you for, for being here. Um, there are no questions in the chat because we have like three more minutes, um, but I think we are good to go. So I really just again, thank you for being here. Um, and I hope that everyone that attended was able to take away a lot. Um, and um, this recording will be made available to everyone. Uh, but again, thank you to our panelists for making time to be here with us today and dropping all the gems uh, that were needed as we look to implement social emotional learning across school districts. So thank you everyone. And actually I'm gonna take a group picture um, right now. I, I, we're just gonna do this while even though people are watching. So um, if you could unspot me, uh, Lori, I just wanna take a group picture but I can't take it without when it's spotlighted. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna count to three. One, two, three. Awesome. All right. So I got my group chat. Um, so I'll make sure everybody gets everything. But thank you again. Um, and uh, we'll do this again. And hopefully next time we do it, we'll do it. We'll all do it in person. So have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody.